Welcome to Just Asia, HRC TV's weekly human rights program. These are the headlines. India's Supreme Court orders probe into Manipur extrajudicial killings. Philippines, deadliest country in Asia for environmental activists, says new report. Dalit children denied education in Nepal. Indonesia's new regulation against mass organizations worrying. Non-Muslims forced into menial jobs in Pakistan. Four urgent appeals from India, Nepal, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Welcome to AHRC TV's Just Asia. I'm Annie Lin. This week, Just Asia begins with India, where the Supreme Court passed a historic judgment last Friday ordering the Central Bureau of Investigation to probe into the allegations of fake encounters by uniformed personnel in the conflict-ridden state of Manipur. To ensure an impartial investigation, the court ordered that no member of the Manipur police will be a part of the probe. Human Rights Alert is the second petitioner in this case, and Just Asia speaks to its director, Bablu Longtambam, for his comments on the judgment and its significance. Well, this is quite historic because this is, to the best of my understanding, the first time ever in the annals of the judicial history of India that an en masse criminal investigation is being ordered. However, uncertain on who are the people who are going to do the actual investigation, what would be their track record, what would be their integrity, uh, we would have expected the Supreme Court to do this directly, but the Supreme Court had delegated this work uh, of choosing the investigators to the Central Bureau of Investigation. We would like to still pin our hopes that the Central Bureau of Investigation will do, will choose the right people with the, the necessary integrity and the capacity, as well as people who would not cave into political pressure. Considering the nature of the crime and, and the way in which the, the central government also try to, uh, you know, challenge the earlier Supreme Court order, this might not be very easy uh, and there could be a lot of pressure. So it is optimism, but at the same time, uh, a little fear, which we cannot uh, help but uh, feel at this moment. The other aspect is its comment on the National Human Rights Commission. In the very petition that we filed, we have uh, stated that the National Human Rights Commission has been quite ineffective in stopping this kind of mass extrajudicial execution over a prolonged period of time. And we call them the toothless tiger. The National Human Rights Commission was not very happy with it, and they have expressed it in the court. But now that the Supreme Court have also, after perusing the entire evidence, have come to the same conclusion that, yes, indeed, so far as manifestation in places like Manipur is concerned, the National Human Rights Commission has, in fact, become a toothless tiger. One hopes that this course correction is taken up quickly uh, so that the National Human Rights Commission uh, should be empowered to protect not just people in the mainland India, but also in places like Manipur, which has been neglected and discriminated for historically for a very long time. Uh, we do hope that the course correction takes place soon. Justice has different meanings for different people. At least this has become a very good organizing, a uh, raising point to organize the victims. And the victims are coming together in an unprecedented way. So the process of walking towards justice is already on. The good uh, the news is that after the Supreme Court has started perusing this case and the matter is being taken up systematically and seriously, the phenomena of extrajudicial execution has at least uh, stopped in Manipur. One can comfortably say uh, that this whole phenomena of just picking up people from their houses or from the street and bumping them off and alleging them as terrorists, is this phenomena is fortunately gone. It is not there. One only hopes that it doesn't get repeated and also that the, 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 the path to justice for those victims who are already victimized for this decades together comes soon. And to that extent, the uh, Supreme Court judgment is a step in the right direction but this is only a step. There are many, many mountains that we have to cross before the families finally say that justice is done. Next, Philippines is the deadliest country in Asia for environmental activists and the third deadliest in the world, said a new report launched last week by international group Global Witness, titled Defenders of the Earth, 
Global Killings of Land and Environmental Defenders in 2016, the report reveals 28 killings occurred last year in the Philippines, most related to struggles against mining. According to Leon Dolce, campaign coordinator of Calicasan People's Network for the Environment, they expect the trend to worsen this year with no fundamental change in the country's environmental policies on one hand and increasingly fascist police and military campaigns of President Rodrigo Duterte on the other. Dolce said they have monitored at least 10 environment-related killings in the first half of 2017. Local groups are calling on the government to end the attacks on land, environment and human rights defenders. Moving to Nepal, certain groups of children continue to be denied their basic right to education due to schools practicing discrimination. Most recently, Mina and Sanchez Marik had to give up their dream of educating their children due to untouchability practiced at the Adabut Primary School in Malev, located near their home. The Malik children were treated inhumanely and regularly sent home by school teachers and parents of non dalit students. Finally, the children were compelled to drop out. Despite Dalit's thirst for education, Dalit children are not allowed to share benches with upper caste children and even teachers are reluctant to teach them. Many upper caste parents threaten to take their children out of schools if Dalit children are admitted. For these reasons, it is hard for Dalit children to obtain proper education. Though Nepal's constitution ensures every individual's right to live a dignified life free from any discrimination and defines untouchability as a punishable act, in practice, caste discrimination continues and children are denied education. The government must do more to end this human rights violation. Indonesian President Yoko Widodo passed a regulation last week replacing the country's law on mass organizations. The new regulation allows the government to disband mass organizations without any judicial process and to criminally charge members for blasphemy. The blasphemy charge will hold a maximum sentence of 20 years imprisonment. In particular, the new regulation is targeting Hizbut Tahrir, an organization which is opposed to Indonesia's founding Pancasila principles and the country's constitution. The group's aim is to establish a global caliphate with Sharia principles. However, human rights groups and civil society are protesting the new regulation, which can be used to restrict civil and political rights in particular the right to freedom of association and assembly. Activists see it as a throwback to the authoritarian Suharto regime, which used a government decree to ban the Indonesian Communist Party in 1966. There are also concerns that the new regulation will be used as a tool of persecution against religious minority groups, whose beliefs are always considered in defiance of Islam. Religious discrimination in Pakistan forces non-Muslims to work as scavengers, sweepers and sewage workers. These jobs are reserved for minority religions, making it difficult for non-Muslims to find better jobs. Recent newspaper advertisements have not only stated that only non-Muslim persons belonging to the Christian or Hindu faith can apply for the menial jobs, but also that they must take an oath on their respective religious texts not to deny any work assigned to them. With the government systematically reserving sanitation posts for non-Muslims and a lack of political will to improving the status of minority religious groups, they are confined to remain sanitary workers for generations. Non-Muslims are particularly preferred for the hazardous task of clearing sewage lines because they are easily exploited. Also, there is no compensation in the case of non-Muslim deaths. Since 1988, over 80 non-Muslim sanitary workers have died from inhaling toxic fumes while cleaning sewers. The most recent death occurred in June 2017, as Just Asia previously reported. Christian sanitary worker Irfan Masih died in hospital after doctors refused to treat him during the fasting month of Ramadan. Finally, the Urgent Appeals Weekly features four cases from India, Nepal, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Beginning with India, a Muslim youth was beaten while on his farmland by the border security force personnel in Nadia, West Bengal. He was then dragged towards Buri Batala, where his unconscious body was abandoned. In Nepal, a Dalit customer was mercilessly beaten after he dilly-dallied in washing his utensils after drinking alcohol at a local shop come eatery and reportedly urinated in a drunken state. 
In Pakistan, a young student was abducted from the Bhutto family home. Previously, two brothers from this family were abducted, disappeared and extrajudicially killed. Lastly, the chairman of the Committee for the Protection of Rights of Prisoners, Mr. Sanaka De Silva, has been receiving death threats in Sri Lanka. A senior human rights advocate, Mr. De Silva is playing a pivotal role in the protection of prisoners' human rights. That is all for this episode of Just Asia. For more on these and other issues, please visit www.humanrights.asia or www.alrc.asia forward slash Just Asia. Thank you for watching and see you next week.